is Joris Peels. Uh, I'm the community manager of iMaterialize. And uh, we're going to see some movies here showing you uh, some 3D printing processes. And this is the object process that builds up an object layer by layer using a photopolymer. And all the processes of 3D printing basically work the same. They're all basically the same. They're built up an object layer by layer. But they work very, very differently individually. So you have to be careful of that when making like a comparison between desktop, like actual paper printers and 3D printing. These are all very different technology silos. They all work very, very differently. This is fused deposition modeling, where a thin strand of ABS plastic wire is melted uh, into the machine and is built up layer by layer. And this is just a full-size table that comes out of here. It's a small table. And this is another process called stereolithography, uh, by which a, a laser in a, in a bath of resin melts a, uh, or hardens a material. So all these things build up objects layer by layer and you get more unique objects and you get the ability to make things in a geometry that isn't possible in another way. So 3D printing, you can make a ball within a ball or you can make one of something. And this in, in this case, this is a lamp. So any technology that builds up layer by layer. These are some architecture students that have made a very unique thing uh, inside their design. They can embed functionality in it. This comes out of the machine, working out of the machine, and, 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 and the little parts can actually, you know, they can move, they can, uh, they can change shape, and this is what happens. So what, what is 3D printing again? I mean, you saw it already on the video. So you have a 3D file. This 3D file is sliced into lots of different slices, and the machine just builds it up layer by layer by layer. Now, of course, there's an extra step. Now, if you think of something really simple or really complicated, let's say I'm trying to print a wine glass. Now, what's going to happen, of course, is that let's say I'm trying to deposit material in the bowl of this wine glass. It's going to go all over the place. So basically what we do right now is we 3D print support material. So that's a material we're going to remove later, either by hand or we're going to wash it away in some sort. And that means that right now a lot of 3D printing things are... are, are there's a lot of handwork in there. There's a lot of people actually like filing things down or removing the support material. So that's kind of like, you know, it's not, we're not precisely there yet in having like a complete automated manufacturing or pressing a button and then automatically being able to produce anything. But 3D printing is a, a groups of technologies that all are vying for your attention to be the best way to make anything. So a 3D printing technology that can make a shape can make any shape. And a, a 3D printing technology that can make a shape in a completely different way is a competing technology to this. But both of these technologies want to basically let anyone make anything. And that's the goal here. That's the prize that we're all going for. The idea to let anyone make anything they want, whenever they want to, in whatever capacity. Now, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of roadblocks on the way. 3D printing material is expensive. Uh, it is comparable per liter to champagne. I can, you know, some 3D printing materials, these are plastics, are more expensive per kilo than foie gras or steak. Uh, there are certain plastics, like a kind of advanced 3D printing plastics, that per kilo are more expensive than titanium. So uh, I don't know who's making a plastic that's more expensive than titanium, but they're having a very, very good time and they drive a really nice car. Um, this and the machine cost and the fact that, that you do have to build everything up layer by layer, right? You do have to actually make a thing. It means that the process doesn't really scale that well uh, compared to like a traditional injection molding process. So in an injection molding type of situation, <clears throat> you know, your first, your first injection mold is going to cost you, you know, 100,000 euros in Europe, 10,000 in China, and you can make a thing for you know, 10 cents a, a thing. So 10 cents an identical copy, and that is what you'll be able to do. And that, of course, scales a lot. 3D printing, certain things, we asked the kids today, we had these lampshades. We, call, we asked them, well, how much does it cost to make this lampshade, or how much would you pay for it? And they said a, a dollar and a half, 50 cents, 80 cents. And I was like, okay, it's 40 euros. And the kids are like, okay, you guys are clearly onto something, but not yet there. <laughs> And this is a problem with the, the cost issue, is, is a cost. And this, and, and this means that if you would like, we could build you a couch. There are 3D printers right now that can make things with two meters by two meters. 
and it would be approximately 30,000 euros. And I'd be giving you a really good deal on the couch. And, and so this, this means that for very large objects, it's still not a very tenable technology uh, you know, for the consumers to let you guys make something. Although we would encourage you, if you would like, you know, feel free to approach anyone, try to make stuff like this. It's very exciting, but I don't, we don't think it's tenable for you. Um, so what is mass production? Millions of copies for millions of people. So we're all unique and we're all individuals. And that's also, we tell kids this, oh, you're so unique and everybody's different and be your own person. And what do we do most of our lives? We focus on buying identical things. We make things with millions of copies. Virtually everything you own has a million cousins that look exactly alike. And what we're basically doing is we're building a mediocre world. We're building a world where, per definition, everything sucks. Because everything is made for a million people. Try to visualize a million people. I don't know if you've ever made a design decision or tried to like, make a thing like a TV remote control or something like that for a million people, you know, you're going to come up with like the Hollywood blockbuster of products. It's going to be formulaic, it's going to be simple, it's going to be dumbed down, and it's not going to please anyone. And this is most of the things in the world. Now, of course, mass production, you kind of have to do this because that is your cost structure. That is what you have to do. That is like your reality. You can't make the best product for anyone per definition. So what did they find a very, very long time ago? That it's easier to convince us to buy a product than to make the right thing for us. And that's the world we live in at this moment. No one gets a perfect thing. We all kind of want things, and, and marketing becomes more and more higher level all the time. It's, it's, not, about, it's not enough to talk about the product. You, you have to become happy with the product. It's not enough to... To, to want to become happy, you have to become fulfilled. You know, these marketing promises are rising and rising and becoming more and more outlandish. And you don't have choice. You don't have anything that's actually a good product. Now, this is a question. I'm going to ask you a question. Are all McNuggets unique? How many different shapes of McNuggets do you think there are approximately? Four. There are four different McNuggets. <laughs> so this is my problem with mass production. They don't even care enough for us to lie to us properly. <laughs> right? The, the average serving size is six McNuggets. You would think they would make eight different kinds of McNuggets. Right? Let's make it hard for these people to know they're being fooled. But they don't even care. I mean, the marginal cost of making eight McNugget shapes instead of four McNugget shapes has got to be like the billions of McNuggets. Right? There's got to be nothing, right? <laughs> so, but the problem with this is that, you know, they are, you know, we're not living in a cookie cutter world. We're living in a McNugget cutter world, right? Where I remember my, my sister when she was like about four or five, uh, she, would, she would kind of look out of the window of the car at the golden arches and kind of, kind of follow it. <laughs> Like there being some kind of golden arches, like GPS or lair or something going like, you know, that's what, that's what children are. They're being pre presumed to be like, you know, a golden arches lair. That's what like eight-year-old kids are. And I want my little toy and I want my standardized experience and I want my reward and I want, give me my sugar now, give me my fat now because this is what this brand has done to me. It's etched into my mind. And this standardized experience is etched into my mind. And we lose, and I think a lot of the people are really, really on point here, that we lose the idea that, you know, we're able to create ourselves, or we're able to create our own experiences ourselves, or we're able to just say, you know what, I want a belt buckle that's just my belt buckle, and I don't care what you think. Um, so I'm going to show you some things that we made. This is a person who restored a, a Carmen Ghia, a Carmen automobile, and they were unable to obtain the, the, the original lettering. So they 3D printed the lettering for the Carmen. Now, I don't know how many people are restoring Carmen cars, especially in this fetching color, but I think the market for these things is very, very tiny. Uh, these are some bookends, also you know, bad aspect ratio. Um, uh, and uh, so these bookends are kind of whimsical, kind of fun, fun bo bookends. And you, know, you don't have to like them, but that's not exactly the point. 
And this is a thing, and, I, and this is a kind of like reality check slide just in case. I mean, this is how the thing comes out of the machine, right? This is a full-size chair. Uh, I could say chaise longue, but I was too worried about pronouncing it. And then all these support structures have to be removed by hand, by a person. So there's a person in Western Europe, in this case, manufacturing this thing by hand, and they have to spend literally days filing this thing down, removing all the support material. And then it has to be painted by hand. So do, if you see a lot of 3D printed things, I could show you a lot of really amazing things. But do remember, and I'll try to tell you if I show you something here today that uh, you know, looks a little bit too good. But do remember there's a lot of labor involved. And a lot of processes, maybe 30% of the cost of the thing is labor. Now the interesting thing about this is we are manufacturing things in Western Europe. Right? There's a lot of service bureaus that, that make things for companies, prototypes, spare parts, uh, things like that that are now manufacturing inside the European Union, in places like the United Kingdom, uh, in places like uh, the Netherlands, or of course Belgium and other countries. And they're like, you know, blue collar jobs. And, and of course in Belgium they're called actually arbeiters, which is kind of weird, I think. But, um, <laughs> but there, there's, these are people that are actually doing manufacturing. And the reason why we're not, uh, you know, this cannot at this moment be outsourced to China is the fact that it's just location. The fact that some of, our, some of the customers who order these things just want things in 24 hours, want things the next day, want things, uh, you know, to be made very, very quickly. And it's just the problem is that it cannot be shipped to Europe quickly enough. Now, of course, if you think further, if you think these 3D printers are going to become more automated and better, you're either going to have the scenario that everyone's going to have them, you'll print out on location, and there was no work involved at all in making things. So any kind of manufacturing, in that case, is, is going to be take place anywhere. It's going to take place close to where people are, on the one hand. But we don't know if, if that's the future yet, because this industry, 3D printing, has been around for 20 years, and it's a billion-dollar industry, but nobody has any idea really where we're going. This is a titanium ring. A good example of something that, if you want to give something that's truly meaningful, rather than walking into a store and selecting something in a predefined price range and saying, yes, I love you this much, honey, just like the 10,000 other people that bought the same ring, you can create your very own ring. The designer of this ring made a pattern for his entire family, so he made different jewelry pieces for different members of his family. This is a doorknob, 3D printed in steel. Uh, Again, you might not care about this doorknob. You might not like this design. You might not want to spend this much money on it. You might not also like the exploding cappuccino lamp. But somebody likes it. One person likes it. And that's enough. That's enough for us to produce it. That's enough for 3D printing to produce it. And that's enough for that person to perhaps sell it. Because your first prototype is also your product. And you have no inventory with 3D printing. So you just put it online, sit back. If nobody orders it, you've still got your lamp, right? It's still reasonably priced. It's more expensive than other people's lamps, maybe. You can make a lamp for a couple hundred euros. And that's the kind of this, this, this other thing. And this is also a very unique case. This is a person that was building their house. A lot of people build houses. And, and they had a one problem. They had a very specific problem, like a balustrade and a stairwell. They wouldn't connect. Well, 3D printed. These are some bowls. Again, nice designs. And they don't have to appeal to anyone. They don't have, or they could be appealed to a particular niche. You know, it's perfectly possible to say, you know, I would like to you know, make a fashion brand or make a design brand in bowls for gay Nigerian men. I don't know how many gay Nigerian men there are in the world, but as long as there's one of them and I can sell them one bowl, it's a perfectly viable market for me. And this is a very ty different type of, of way of doing business if you would consider this a way to do business. This is a, a reed box. This is a box for reeds for an alt sax. This didn't exist in the capacity that it wanted. A person made this very, very specific thing. This is a person who had a tom tom and went on a lot of bicycle journeys in the weekend. And so they said, Well, I want a holder on my bicycle so I can use my tom tom on the weekend also. This is also an idea I. I, you know, nobody had thought of I, until this person, I guess. And this is King Tut. We took a CAT scan of King Tut, and then King Tut was 3D printed. And again, this is another reality check moment. The, 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 the plastic is how it came out of the machine, and the rest was finished by the artist. 
So it's possible to produce any shape, but not yet any kind of drama or any kind of final finish. This is a concept car. Uh, this is yet another concept car. This is a Citroën. And this is another concept car, a Jaguar. This is kind of unique things. Like they're only making one of these. And this is something where, where you can make, uh, you can do the interior of it in one particular way. Uh, this is a wall divider or a room divider or, or a wall monument that is very, very kind of reminiscent of the Borg, perhaps. <laughs> the artist can make one version of it and because of the file can print it out in different, ver different materials quite easily for them. And what I think is interesting is that the same person that made those things made this, the fall of the down, which is a lamp to me, which aesthetically is very, very different than, 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 uh, than, than the lamp that they, were conceived, they conceived previously. There's three, two 3D printed things in this picture. First is a skull, and the skull is made in plastic so that the surgeons can, can, can plan their surgery, can look if things fit, can kind of talk to each other while holding this thing, which makes it easier for them. And the second thing is this titanium insert. This person had a particular hole in their skull, and they made a patient-specific <coughs> medical implant for this person. This is a lamp. Again, a lamp with perhaps a too much of a radical design for some, but again, a, a viable lamp within this manufacturing paradigm that is 3D printing. This, I think, is the one 3D printing use that I didn't anticipate, I, I couldn't conceive of. It's a mass-produced part, which is then checked in a 3D printed, the orange part are lo called locators, which is like a 3D printed kind of housing that precisely checks this car part to see if it's the right dimensions. And then every time these things used to be milled out of a solid block of uh, aluminum, and now you can just make this locator, which is just a much more low weight, easier to use kind of uh, thing. This is a, a Japanese uh, Ferrari collector who went to Zagata and said, I would like my own Ferrari, please. <coughs> and, uh, and then this person then you know, certain parts of the car were uh, like the lighting and the lighting housing you see were, were manufactured using 3D printing technology. Oh, sorry. This is a full size, I think, I keep getting them too confused. I think this is a full size CAT scanner. And this is just made in one piece. And this, this is where the industry really came from. This is what, you know, the industry's been around, 3D printing's been around for 20 years. It's had a couple of name changes. I think it was additive manufacturing, free-form manufacturing, uh, and now it's 3D printing, uh, and, but officially it's still called additive manufacturing. So it's a bit confusing to a lot of people that this is a billion-dollar industry. And this is basically what the industry does, right? A particular company, they're making a new version of something. We want a shiny thing to show the people in marketing. And that's basically what we do. This is a potty, uh, which is also made like this. This is a skill thing. Dental guides, which you put in your mouth so the dentist doesn't hurt you. This is work by Frank Stella, which is an American artist. This is two by three meters. Also interesting. This is Iris van Herpen, collections, clothing. But clothing in the sense of haute couture, right? I couldn't, we couldn't at this stage make this cost effective for you to wear, and it would not be comfortable for you to wear at all either. This is by Nick Erving. <laughs> a work that, that, that is very, very otherworldly. I've, I've never seen it personally, the real thing, and it's just like very strange. And this is by Rittig. Rittig is 10. Or so we're told. He spent about half an hour working in a program called 3D Tin. It's a browser-based program which allows you to use little blocks to build up things. And Rittig played around with this and created his own pair of sunglasses. We asked the kids before today to try it try out 3D tin, and we 3D printed Ritik's sunglasses. So he is able to, with no training, we just sent him an email, here's this program, please use Chrome, because there's some problems with the browser, and go nuts, make things. And not everything was immediately 3D printable, but certain things were. And this is another, Faye made another kind of, kind of bracelet here. Also a 10-year-old who made this in her own time. Now, the one thing is that these, you know, I could conclude with the fact that, you know, 3D printing is so easy, a 10-year-old could do it. 
But I'm going to conclude with the fact that we were all makers once. When we were kids, we used to make things all the time, right? You'd make poems, you'd make like little ashtrays or puppets or anything or like posters and drawings. And at one point, you stop making things because you don't have time, right? You stop making things because, because you don't feel like it anymore, because it's not right, because you worry too much about what people think about the things you make. Because you don't think you have the skills anymore. So you do not anymore make things. And making things is the most fantastic thing in the world. To say, I made this. And 3D printing is one of the ways that you can make things again. And I hope that you will make things. Thank you very much for your time. Thank <laughs> you.